Today we are uh, entering the future. Uh, we, we caught up with all the progress over the last uh, 30 years, maybe 20 years, and the most recent lectures were about today, what's going on today, and uh, yeah. But you know, the crazy ideas of uh, yesterday is what's in our pockets uh, today in the form of uh, iPhones and things like that. So uh, if, if any of this works out, uh, who knows? Um, I'm uh, grateful to um, Andrew Cleland uh, at UCSB for slides on the surface code, Matthias Troyer uh, on the D-Wave computer and uh, Mikhail Wimmer on uh, topological uh, quantum computation. And uh, we begin with the surface code. Uh, okay, so these are slides from uh, Andrew Cleland, uh, but I, I will uh, first motivate uh, a little bit. Um, we discussed qubits, right? And we discussed uh, first in individual qubits and coupled qubits, and always our motivation uh, for studying qubits was, well, they're fascinating uh, physical systems that teach us about quantum mechanics, but of course also uh, you may uh, want to consider them as uh, building blocks for a quantum computer. And uh, many, many people around the world think about a uh, quantum computer um, as, uh, you know, as uh, something that we already have and uh, consider the f anticipate future problems that this computer will encounter. And one of these problems that also classical computers have is how to correct for errors, how to correct for quantum errors. That's called error correction. And uh, for the last uh, 15 years or so, there was this error correction scheme that was dominating the, the, the narrative, uh, which was based on, uh, you know, you have a qubit, and uh, it can perform many coherent operations, maybe 10,000. And then once in 10,000 it fails, and then you come in with an algorithm, figure out that there is an error. Um, so you have some other qubits around it that, that uh, interrogate it. And then if there is an error, you fix it and, uh, and you can proceed with your quantum algorithm. And so the uh, requirements to do that error correction, which I will not talk about anymore today, the, the standard error correction, a very stringent requirements. So something like one in ten thousand operations, uh, that uh, error rate, that's the starting point for that thing to work. So you know, our qubits have to be really, really good, and also coupled qubits have to be really good. Uh, so single qubit gates and two qubit gates have to be very, very, very high fidelity for that to work. And uh, a few years ago, um, maybe just really one year ago, uh, on our radar we um, received this uh, new idea called surface code and the advantage is that the threshold, the operating threshold is several orders of magnitude lower. It is still something like 99 percent but uh, something that is not so insane. Uh, but it is a crazy scheme. So here is a scheme. Let me introduce you to the surface code. Uh, this is the surface and each dot here, be it red or white, that's a physical qubit. So think a single spin or a single transmon qubit or any qubit that you, that's your favorite qubit. And these qubits are coupled uh, with the nearest neighbor couplings. And these um, colorful uh, flowers, the couplings, uh, those uh, designate uh, quantum operations on two qubits that we are, have to constantly do. So this surface of qubits just sits there and uh, there are control lines coming in and we have to constantly measure um, these plaquettes of four qubits and measure uh, either X or Z um, rotation, um, C naught gates of these qubits. So 
the stuff we learned in the last four lectures, the single qubit gates and the two qubit gates, these are just the little building blocks here. Th this is just constantly going on. And the purpose of that is to keep this grid of physical qubits in some kind of a coherent state, to preserve the coherence. So in a, some kind of a state phi, uh, and uh, by running these uh, uh, qubits, you keep it in a state phi. You, if you go into details of this code, there are the qubits play two different roles. The red ones are the ones that um, actually contain the wave function, and the white ones are sort of stabilizer qubits. But of course, they're completely interchangeable. The system is perfectly symmetric. You can also say these have the wave function, these have the stabilizing function. Um, but this is a this is a kind of a, a canvas, the starting point for the surface code. The, the these kind of um, grid of many many qubits. So you could you can think of also uh, these couplings, uh, how to physically implement them. They could be uh, capacitively coupled qubits. They could be coupled via resonators. Right, so what we what we learned uh, from previous lectures, uh, so you can pick your architecture and you can decide what is the best, what gives you the best chance to implement this surface code. And uh, I must say, the leading quantum computing groups right now in the world uh, are seriously considering uh, implementing surface code rather than anything else, even though it has a huge, huge overhead, as I will show you in the next slides. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, what what is constantly going on in each of the plaquettes um, between each of the sites. So you have uh, four of the red guys and one guy in the middle, and uh, this guy measures the red guys. And what he does first, you initialize him into the ground state, then you rotate him into maybe x or z or with a single qubit gate, and then you do these two qubit gates. These are the C naught gates on two qubits. And you do them on the first, the second, and the third, and the fourth, and then you do some rotation, and you read out. And, th and these readouts tell you if you're still coherent or not. So these are important. Um, and um, you have some kind of a clock speed at which you go around the surface, and you do some simultaneous measurements of of the, it's a bunch of these C naught gates. And uh, yeah, this is the good news. Uh, this kind of thing, for this thing, you need the overall fidelity of 99.5%. And that is a relatively low number. Relatively low. So th these slides are from a superconducting group, and uh, superconducting qubits are the highest fidelity qubits to date, uh, which are in a nice and uh, compact architecture. And so uh, they quote uh, numbers for transmon qubits. Uh, and uh, it turns out the numbers, uh, on the, if you put them all together, the best numbers, they look quite favorable. Um, of course, there's a um, an incomplete list of various problems with qubits that teach you different time scales, but uh, these primary ones, the uh, T1 and T2 times, the, the relaxation and the dephasing time, and uh, the fidelity, the accuracy with which we can apply control pulses via microwave lines, those all look pretty good. So the fidelities here are, you know, the numbers that they get are every number is above or a little bit above the threshold. Of course you have to multiply all these numbers together to get the overall fidelity and then you probably fall below uh, the 99.5 percent that you need to implement the surface code. And it does not include all these problems. For example, crosstalk. If you put uh, 100 of these uh, transmons together 
uh, what kind of problems will you run into? All these control lines, uh, will they couple to each other? Uh, that's crosstalk. One of our F noise, that's a low frequency noise. So if an algorithm has to go on for a long time, uh, the system will start changing and the one or F noise grows with frequency. The lower the frequency, the higher the noise. So the longer we wait, the more noise we get. And uh, so uh, these problems will hit you uh, in big circuits. But here is um, what people consider uh, for one elementary qubit based on surface code. This one is a memory cell. And here is uh, where the notion of logical qubits comes into play. At some point I introduced to you qubits that you can define on several physical systems. For example, in the last lecture we had the qubit defined on two physical spins, on two electrons. We can define a single qubit. Well, that was still one physical qubit, just defined on two electrons. Here, this is one logical qubit defined on 40 physical qubits. So a single logical qubit in a surface code is uh, about 40 of these transmont qubits. Yeah? So you have to build a pretty large circuit. But then uh, there are also um, you have a bunch of degrees of freedom in such a loop, but you, you also constrain a bunch of them by these uh, loop constraints and uh, the constant measurements that you do, by parities of these loops. So in the end, actually, it turns out you left with two degrees of freedom, one kind of along x and one along z in, in this crazy space. And I don't want you to understand it all just to get the flavor of the, of the ideas that people have about quantum computing. So this will be a logical qubit defined on the surface code. And this is just to store a, a, a single quantum bit of information, 0 or 1. Now, to actually encode information, uh, there is a very visual way to do that in the surface code. Uh, you, you make a hole in the surface code. You don't physically pluck out a qubit from the surface, but you stop measuring here. Remember all these crosses, the yellow and the green, those are constant C0 gate operations that you perform on, on these qubits. So you leave out uh, several C0 operations, you leave a hole, and uh, in that hole, you kind of encode a qubit, or sometimes in a cut. And uh, so you um, define qubits like that. You can define several qubits like that. You define them by cuts or by holes. That, so if you have a large surface of these nodes, it will have a bunch of holes, places where you don't measure, and uh, those will be your qubits. They will be located on the surface like that. So then uh, there are also already known protocols for how to measure, how to initialize these qubits, and they have to do with, uh, you know, if you, you, this is your qubit, and then you have to stop measuring along these qubits, and then reset them to ground, and then uh, uh, do all these measurements and after that you have measured your qubit. After that you know whether you were in the uh, zero state or in the one state in this qubit. Th this is the kind of thing you have to do. So uh, turn off some qubits, reset them, measure. That, that's the kind of thing to do in the surface code. And of course, uh, you can also move them around, right? Uh, so this slide shows that, well, here's a, here's a qubit, and uh, here we're gonna turn off some operations, and then turn on the upper ones, and the hole has moved by one cell. And uh, the statement is that actually, it's the same qubit, I think. Nothing has changed 
just uh, slightly, slightly moved around in the surface. So uh, another thing I forgot to mention uh, is that um, you know, if an error occurs in one of the nodes, because you're constantly measuring around it and you're encoded in 40 qubits, uh, it's very easy for you to find that error. So basically an error is like an er erroneous, uh, the wrong answer from one of these CNOT gates. And so when that happens, you know where the error is and then you uh, go in and correct it. You flip, flip that one qubit. And, uh, there are also situations where one of these qubits is flipped, but the next one over is also flipped, and then nothing actually happens. You, you are not sensitive to that. The, 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 qubit, the macroscopic qubit state is protected. So the, that, and that's why you need a much lower fidelity for this kind of surface code, because you have an easy way to correct for errors as you do all these operations all the time. And uh, the way you do all these uh, green and uh, yellow readouts uh, and gates is uh, a little bit similar to the clocking of a conventional processor, like an Intel processor. There's always a clock and you kind of uh, send uh, pulses along buses. It's not exactly like that, but it's a little bit the same philosophy. You are constantly clocking some operations and the substantive stuff happens when you perform kind of open up cells, move them around at those moments. Okay. Very important thing happens when you take one hole and move it around another hole. So of course you can do that. Uh, you can just uh, geometrically imagine it. Uh, this slide goes through pa painful details of how you would do that, but that is essentially what they do here, is uh, start with two qubits like that. Uh, that's uh, called a Z-cut, so it's a cut that connects two holes. And uh, then they braid these cuts around each other. And uh, in, at the end of the day, they have uh, swapped them uh, in space. <coughs> move them around each other. So th that is called uh, braiding. Uh, we will he hear this word again at the end of the lecture. Um, and uh, turns out this is equivalent to a CNOT gate on two of the surface code qubits. Again, I'm not going to go through the math, math of this. Um, this is for a longer lecture. Uh, if you're interested, there is a very nice review on all this on archive. But um, this is a really a nice uh, topological concept uh, that is applied to, uh, to the surface code. So it also reveals uh, also the topological nature of this code. So the, if you hear words topological protection, this is not exactly the same thing, but it is a, a, a distant uh, relative of that concept, this uh, surface code. So now we know uh, how to do two qubit operations. Single qubit operations are um, constitute in, uh, actually I don't remember how you do those. I think it's uh, uh, making different cuts. But um, there is a full set of operations on one and two qubits in the surface code. And then there is a protection protocol for, for these qubits. And finally at the end uh, Andrew has put together uh, a few numbers for how many qubits you need for different, for different tasks. Um, so assuming this uh, relatively forgiving uh, fidelity for these operations, uh, if you just wanted to store um, a memory qubit and you wanted uh, a pretty, pretty good error rate, pretty low error rate, you uh, may need something like 600 physical qubits. That's uh, for one. Compared to... Hmm? To make one logical qubit. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, uh, but then it scales uh, 
you know, not proportionally. So uh, this is actually the good, the good news part. Uh, you know, th these are just crazy numbers, of course, 4,000 qubits, but then the, you are really, really well protected uh, from errors. Now, if you wanted to uh, demonstrate with a fairly high fidelity a, s a single C naught gate, so one braiding operation of two qubits, you need about 2,000 qubits. But if you want to run a full quantum algorithm like Shor's algorithm, you're looking at 40 million qubits for a 15 bit number. Is there physical qubits or logical qubits? Physical, okay. I think, yeah. That's, I remember. Yeah, physical qubits. And, um, well, it's only a factor of 40 off, so. <laughs> 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 no big deal, huh? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and this is actually not so practical for cracking the various codes. Uh, we want to crack uh, numbers which have uh, you know, several hundred digits. Uh, so for a more uh, ambitious algorithm, we want uh, a billion qubits. And then to put it back into uh, context, but is this now crazy? Is this completely crazy? Uh, probably, uh, though at the same time, the Intel chip already has billions of transistors. So we, we know how to deal with billions of electronic elements and we know how to clock them at the gigahertz speed. So our clocking, our C naught gates, uh, that stuff, uh, that kind of stuff, we know how to do that at gigahertz speeds. Here's the bad news. These billions of transistors at gigahertz speed, we only need 1,000 wires, pins, to control all of that. And for qubits, so far we don't know how to not have at least one wire per qubit. At least that's what, that's what the experts tell me. So uh, we gotta, we got to come up with a smart trick to do that. Some kind of a bus, some kind of a smart wire. Um, Otherwise, uh, this looks okay, but one billion wires really does not look so, uh, so attractive. Nevertheless, uh, they are going to try, at least uh, if you uh, read a science magazine from one month ago, uh, March 8th, there is a roadmap for superconducting qubits, and we are at the stage of coupled physical qubits, and the next stage is a logical qubit. And uh, so I think they're really all seriously thinking about creating logical qubits. And when they say logical qubit, they mean the surface code. So we're going to see some progress on the surface code. Uh, maybe not to the stage of uh, Shor's algorithm with uh, uh, cracking large numbers, but at least I can guarantee you some of the elementary surface codes will be tried. OK. The next topic, maybe it's not all so bad, right? Uh, you can actually buy a quantum computer today if you have uh, 10 million bucks or so. No? Okay. Uh, me neither. Uh, I blew it all on dilution fridges. Uh, but uh, <coughs> actually, this is also just a dilution fridge inside this fancy box. And so the, these people are to scale. This is not a Dell uh, processor box that sits on your uh, desk in your, in your room. This is actually the size of a room. It, says it is an electromagnetically shielded room made of metal. Inside you can see the metal. And inside of that room there is a single dilution refrigerator with a bunch of lines. Uh, hundreds of lines, you know, each qubit needs a line. Uh, and uh, down there at the bottom, a little processor with a uh, hundred, a few hundred uh, qubits by now. So this company is based in Vancouver, and uh, they've been working for quite some time uh, on this machine. And finally now, somebody bought it, 
uh, Lockheed Martin bought it and uh, they placed it in uh, California at the University of Southern California uh, where you can uh, uh, you don't have to buy it but you can apply for time and uh, go run your programs on it so that is already possible so several uh, leading experts in computational physics got access to this machine and this is also very good because for a long time it was confined to just uh, this company um, s telling us what they're doing um, via papers and uh, talks but, but uh, now external people can play with their device and uh, some really good people uh, got access to it like Daniel Lidar and uh, these slides are from Matthias Troyer who is one of the leaders um, and uh, unfortunately I cannot show you his results because they're not published yet uh, so I can tell you in private or when we stop the camera uh, but <laughs> they look very interesting in, in, uh, these results uh, but I can show you his uh, motivational slides um, so uh, first of all um, this is what uh, we know from the company uh, that first of all uh, this machine is not a quantum computer like I introduced it to you in this course it is not a, a universal quantum computer where uh, 100 or whatever qubits that they have are in a fully entangled state with single and double qubit operations and all the other Di Vincenzo criteria that I described to you it's not that it is instead <coughs> what they call a quantum annealer so it is a limited uh, version suitable for certain tasks it implements a programmable Ising model in a transverse field it, it's, it is designed to solve this one problem and uh, however it uses the immense computational power of quantum mechanics to solve grand challenge problems in an entirely new way yeah, and that is what now the community is testing is this statement correct or not and there is some evidence that it is at least partially correct so that is exciting okay so this is the problem that the machine is trying to solve um, the um, well the Ising model is uh, coupled spins like that in a field so a bunch of spins they have uh, right now the machine has a hundred but the new chip that is already deployed has uh, about 500 uh, spins and they are all pairwise coupled and uh, they are in a field and turns out it corresponds to this problem which is uh, fairly important in different uh, areas of uh, uh, I don't know what the Lockheed Martin bought it to optimize the flight of planes for example so uh, you know uh, this is a important problem um, for some people but uh, what is also interesting about this problem that it is NP hard now not being a mathematician I have no clue what that means but what I know is that when I see NP hard it means that a classical computer should have a hard time solving it and a quantum computer should have a really easy time solving it so NP hard uh, should make you excited and be hard means uh, maybe something quantum and this is what uh, quantum annealer is supposed to do <coughs> uh, quantum annealer uh, well first of all thermal annealer uh, works like that if you have a bunch of uh, potential minima and you heat the system up and then you cool it down you just hope that it finds the, the lowest minimum after after those cycles and uh, quantum annealer does the same but it does that by quantum mechanics by tunneling through the barriers so inside the machine this is actually the protocol that they have here is A and here is B um, A is here and B is here so B is this transverse field and A is uh, uh, these amplitudes here so uh, they uh, slowly turn on the transverse field and they slowly turn off this coupling 
And um, when they do it at the right speed, they have a high probability of this, of this potential. That's roughly what they do. So they set up their uh, qubits, um, and then they turn on the external field, and they do it a thousand times, get statistics of solutions. That's how the machine works. And um, this is um, a challenge. If it is really a quantum computer, a quantum system, then um, the speed at which they go is very uh, important because uh, if they go too slow, uh, if they go slow, they will stay um, always in the ground state, and that's what you want. But if they go a little bit too fast, uh, they will land out Zener tunnel through this anti-crossing and end up in the excited state. But of course, if they go too slow, uh, they will decohere. They will be slower than the coherence time. And uh, they will not take advantage of the immense power of quantum mechanics to solve the grand challenges that they have. And what they have inside is a bunch of flux qubits. In principle, I shouldn't tell you anything else, but just as a refresher, it is a loop with the Joseph junctions, and the two quantum states are uh, left and right circulating currents. So the, as a function of external flux, the potential looks like a double well potential, and there are two solutions inside the well, and those are the two quantum states. And uh, I showed you that people observed coherence in such squids, uh, in such loops, uh, maybe in single loops, in two coupled loops, but these people have hundreds. And so uh, they um, don't claim to have universal control over a hundred, but they cool them down low enough, filter the system well enough from the environment that they hope that there is some coherence in between the loops to enable the solution of this quantum annealer task that they have. So then what they do is they um, arrange these qubits in a grid and they run uh, inductive couplers in between them, like that. And uh, in this early chip, oh yeah, so you can have um, couplings uh, like that. So each of the qubits here is coupled to four qubits like that and then um, so you you have this kind of a this called a chimera plot of couplings so these are the constraints of your Hamiltonian wherever you have a line you can set up uh, a coupling between these spins between these qubits and what you set up from your computer where you sit outside the the room where the, where the dilution fridges is, is the strength of these couplings. So these are uh, inductive couplers and so they are controlled by fluxes uh, like in superconducting qubits. So uh, they allow you to change a little bit these fluxes to affect the couplings between the qubits. And so the full 128 chip looks like that and um, since uh, this uh, work was completed. Now they have achieved 442 qubits. So this is a chip that which has um, four of these like that. And uh, <coughs> I think it's supposed to be 512, but uh, not all of them work. So that, well, they, they tune them up uh, pretty much one by one, I believe. And uh, when they get a high enough number, at some point they say, OK. Uh, we're done. So also for the for the one that's right now at uh, uh, the Southern California, they got 108 to work out of 128. So it's like that. Okay. So now um, this is just to. Um, Again, uh, reiterate the point of where this system is supposed to be. Uh, here, at this end, we have a real uh, perfect quantum system. 
and uh, this is when the coherence times are extremely long. All of these squids are perfectly coherent, and so all of the potential wells are coupled, and we always find the ground state because it's one wave function, and at some point it relaxes to the ground state. Um, and uh, so this would be uh, pretty close to an actual quantum computer, although maybe we wouldn't have controls over all the individual qubits unless we put them in. But this would have a, be a system of that potential. And on that end, with super short coherence times, this is a classical system. It can still work as an annealer, but that would be a classical annealer, uh, maybe a thermal annealer. So we would have to heat up the system a bit and let it uh, bounce around, and with some likelihood it will find the minimum. Um, and here it's a kind of a hybrid. It's a quantum annealer, but it, it uh, temperature still plays a role. So uh, you you have some thermal excitations, and uh, they affect the dynamics of the wave function. But certainly coherence also plays a role. And this is conveniently arranged along the axis of coherence time. And the D-wave system, uh, based on the reported values, is around here. So it's somewhere in between a perfect quantum system and a classical system. So it has a chance of uh, using some kind of quantum uh, coherence in its computation, perhaps incoherent, incoherent quantum. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, you, you can uh, classify it uh, ad infinum. Uh, but um, what the people are doing right now uh, is they're trying to uh, run this computer on different tasks, uh, set up different problems with the spins, with, uh, with the squids, and uh, see if uh, the speed at which the computer uh, solves these problems beats the speed of a classical algorithm for the same thing. And uh, the conclusion was that with 100 qubits, with the uh, previous version of this machine, uh, it was within uh, plausible that it was behaving quantum, that there was a speed up. But um, it was uh, still the fastest computer with the smartest algorithm could still beat this thing. But now, uh, they, all their hopes are with uh, the new generation with 500 qubits, because uh, uh, the, to find a ground state of 500 spins in the Ising model is uh, uh, next to impossible on a classical computer. So if uh, th there is a clear uh, exponential uh, gain that you can demonstrate with the next chip. So uh, fingers crossed for the for the next few months. I think they'll be able to run it and uh, and see if it performs as a quantum computer. So sooner than we think. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about um, topological quantum computing. Uh, and this is uh, probably the craziest uh, of these three uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, that is because not even a single building block of this computer uh, has been fi uh, demonstrated with 100% certainty. There may be some hints, signatures uh, of this thing. Uh, no more. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the physical idea is beautiful and uh, the potential gain is uh, tantalizing, so we should consider it seriously. So in that same science issue on top, uh, quantum computing from March 8, topological quantum computing was one of the four uh, articles that they wrote, along with spin, superconducting, and ion traps. So uh, we should at least talk a little bit about that. <coughs> Um, I will start by introducing the, uh, the carriers, the, the uh, building blocks of this uh, architecture. And they are Majorana fermions. And then I will explain how with Majorana fermions you build a topological quantum computer. And I will not explain 
how you create and uh, measure Majorana fermions. I will do it in the next lecture. Um, so to understand Majorana fermions, uh, we first uh, refresh fermions. And fermions are uh, these things. Uh, fermions are described by these operators. Uh, creation and annihilation operators of a fermion, like an electron. And um, uh, Majorana uh, operators are directly derived from uh, fermionic operators. So look here. Um, you can write any fermion, creation or annihilation, just formally. Just don't even think what that is. Just uh, uh, mathematically, as a sum of two Majorana operators. Let this be your definition of Majorana operators. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, you can, of course, invert this and you can ask yourself, what are Majorana operators? Well, they are a uh, sum or a difference of two fermion operators. Nothing more than that. <coughs> now, of course, fermions, we kind of understand. It's an electron, for example. Electron is a particle. And uh, what does it mean to write an electron in terms of a sum of two operators? I, it seems like that it is completely meaningless. And in most situations it is. But for the purposes of a, um, a picture to hold in your head, you can think of an electron as a little box that has two smaller balls inside. And uh, those two little balls are the two fermion operators, the Majorana fermion operators, the gammas. And under normal circumstances, it is impossible to open that box and take out those balls, take out the gammas, take out the Majorana fermion operators. Under very exotic circumstances, in our imagination, maybe in our lab, it may become possible. And the entire premise of topological quantum computation is based on our ability to open that box of a single electron, take two Majorana balls out of it and separate them in space so that we can access them individually and manipulate them around. Yeah. And in that, in that case, this math gets a, a new meaning. It gets a meaning of a, some, a very distinct particle mm -hmm. which we can uh, put in a certain place in space and call it a Majorana particle. And they are represented by half-filled, uh, half-empty balls. That's because they are superpositions of uh, creation and annihilation. Or in, if we are in, inside a material, inside a semiconductor or a superconductor, this would be a, an electron and a hole. So that's why they are represented by these symbols here. Okay. So we could uh, do all of our second quantization in terms of Majorana operators if we wanted to, if that entertained us enough. That's the message here. But we are interested in situations where they're isolated. OK, so now I have a pair of Majorana fermions. And fundamentally, they always have to come in pairs, because they came from this box. right? There, there is a conservation of electrons in the universe. And there cannot be, universe will be very unhappy if there will be a half an electron. Uh, maybe locally, but uh, if it counts all the electrons in the universe, it better arrive to an integer number. So there will always be a pair of these Majoranas, uh, but they can be, uh, let's imagine they can be separate in space. Uh, but then um, on a pair of Majoranas, I can define it as a box of electrons. And since it can correspond to a C or a C dagger, it can be an empty box or a filled box. It can have one fermion in it or zero. So represented here, these two Majoranas can form uh, 
two states, 0 and 1. And now I put these brackets here, and now they look like qubit states. Qubit states of 0 and 1. And the 0 would be charge 0, no electrons in the box, charge 1, one electron in a box. So these are the two quantum states. And so this F would be um, describing a pair of Majoranas. And so one would be a creation operator on a zero. Okay. So then um, actually the advantage and the, the power of um, doing it this way is because um, now a single electron is stored in two distant objects and that means that for example if we have charge noise which wiggles around one of these the quantum state does not change because electron is stored non-locally and also because the two Majoranas are very far apart uh, there is no overlap between them and that means that they are completely degenerate so they have the same energy and normally that energy is zero um, so they are degenerate and uh, uncoupled to most sources of local noise and uh, if you remember the list those are the main problems with uh, qubits if you have energy level difference you can have relaxation and if you have local sources of noise, you can have dephasing or relaxation as well. So decoherence problem uh, might be much easier to solve with these kind of Majorana delocalized topological qubits. Uh, they are not immune to all kinds of noises. Uh, uh, for example, if there was an electron flying around and it would jump uh, onto this Majorana. It can change the occupation of a box. So if it does that, um, if it jumps on a box, on an empty box, it can create an, a full box. Uh, or it can jump off a full box and uh, so it can scramble states between 0 and 1. So we gotta make sure that there are no loose electrons flying around. And that's called the um, quasi-particle poisoning problem and it is uh, common in certain materials uh, so we gotta gotta solve that problem okay so the the power of uh, this protection is multiplied when you have many of these because the ground state becomes uh, of degeneracy 2 to the power of n minus 1 so colossal degeneracy in the ground state and so this uh, represents a high degree of protection. So actually uh, to make a practical qubit uh, you need at least four Majoranas. I just uh, showed you an example with uh, two Majoranas but you need four. That's because uh, I just told you that we don't want loose electrons flying around but we do want to change the occupation from zero to one. Uh, so where would we get that uh, electron that changes it from 0 to 1? Well, we would get it from another pair of Majoranas. So within such a pair, maybe electron jumping from here to here, those would be the, the real quantum states that you can work with. That this will be isolated from everything else. So practical qubit states would be described like that. 0, 0, and 1, 1. So this is not unusual to you. We already talked about... Uh, qubits defined on two spins, on two electrons. Well, here is one electron, here is another electron. It's four Majoranas, it's only two electrons. So, this is a uh, along those lines. Okay. So I, I, um, I didn't explain, but I motivated to you why these are good qubits from the point of view of protection, uh, why they are protected from noises. Uh, now I tell you how to manipulate these qubits, and it has to do with uh, unusual statistics that these Majoranas are supposed to have. Uh, we start with uh, statistics 
of particles in 3D. We know it's either boson or fermion statistics, and it has to do the way we figure out whether you're a boson or a fermion is we take two identical particles and we try to swap them in space. So if we are in a three-dimensional space here, uh, uh, a two-time swap is equivalent to bringing one particle around the other uh, in a loop like that. And uh, of course, if it's 3D, you can uh, deform this loop any way you like and uh, just completely go around this particle and uh, it's equivalent to not moving the particles at all. So moving one particle around the other is equivalent to not moving at all. And therefore, when you exchange particles twice in 3D, uh, nothing changes, and so you have only two options for statistics uh, for a single exchange, either plus or minus here, and that gives you bosons or fermions. Okay, we all know that, but now um, let's take these Majoranas and uh, let's say they're only allowed to live on a two-dimensional surface, like in a two-dimensional electron gas, for example. Uh, here are the Majoranas, beautiful, uh, half filled, half empty, also because they're in floating in the surface. Well, of course now, if we bring the p one particle around the other, we cannot squeeze this path to avoid this particle. That's not possible anymore. We have to always go around this particle. And when we move one particle around the other, what we get is phase, phase accumulation. So in this situation, in 2D, we might be in a situation where when we move around once, we get a phase factor in the wave function. And of course, plus and minus, that's also phase, but that's a phase of uh, pi. And this phase can be anything. And so Frank Vilcek, some time ago, called these particles anions. Not bosons or fermions, though these would be called two pions and pions in this nomenclature, but he called them anions. And anions are still pretty boring, I must say. The non-boring ones are the non-abelian anions. And here, this slide explains the difference. So, abelian anions are the ones where, no matter how you move, the second against the, around the first, or the first around the second, or uh, in which order you perform the rotations, the end result is just the sum of two phases that you get. So here we did one, then two, and here we did two, then one, and the, the answer is the same. It's the same wave function multiplied by the same phase. So it doesn't matter the order. That's called abelian. Now this is called non-abelian. The order matters. The order in which you do these operations matters. And that is only possible if you have a degenerate ground state. And what happens when you change the order is you go from one ground state to the other, because you have several ground states of the same energy. Uh, and so this is represented by the different functions, psi a, psi b, psi, psi gamma. So you go from one ground state to the other, or to a different superposition of ground states, depending on how you move one particle around the other. And if you interplace uh, these paths, you get a different answer, because b times a is not equal to a times b. So that's just a definition. You cannot see it from this equation. That's a definition of a non-abelian particle. So now I, I will not, again, go through the math or explain it to you, but I will try to motivate it to you a little bit. Back to our 4 Majorana qubit. We can define two fermions here, indicated by the dashed lines. This fermion will be fermion 1, 2, containing Majoranas 1 and 2. And this one will be fermion 3, 4, containing Majoranas 3 and 4. 
and we can define two quantum states 0, 0 and 1, 1. Well, we can define other states, but let's define these states. All right. But we can also define the two fermions like that, can't we? We can define 1, 3 and 2, 4. 1, 3 will be gamma 1 and gamma 3, and 2, 4 will be gamma 2 and gamma 3. So then these quantum states will correspond to these superpositions for the other quantum states, for the basis states of these two Majoranas. So now, let's exchange two of these Majoranas. Let's uh, see if I exchange these two, I exchange a pair of Majoranas that belong to, to both pairs uh, like that. So uh, if I, this is different from exchanging like this, for example. So the, if I exchange like that, I break all the, I mess up all the pairs that I made. So now, zero, zero state goes into this state, and one, one state goes into this state. So I have created entangled states of fermions that I defined previously. No matter what basis, in any basis that, that I had before. Because the two bases were symmetric. So this interchange is a, is a qubit gate. You can treat it as a qubit gate that creates uh, this kind of a rotation. And this is what you have to do to operate a topological quantum computer. You have to be able to control the positions of these Majoranas and swap them in space. Another thing you have to do, of course, in terms of readout, what do you have to read out? Blackrods? Yeah, charge. You have to have charge readout. So we already discussed in this course a number of different charge sensors, right? Uh, single electron transistors, transmon qubits are sensitive to charge. Um, any of that will work. Need to need to be able to read out charge. Okay, so to be a little bit more formal, because um, uh, these slides are from Mikhail Wimmer, the theorist, uh, he defines a braid operator. A braid operator is like that. You have a product of Majoranas. So this, this product of two Majoranas you, you see uh, pretty often in, uh, in uh, papers on Majoranas, for example, in a fractional Josephson effect. Um, and uh, yeah, if you just apply this operator, you start with gamma 1, and you apply this operator, and you end up with minus gamma j. Or you start with gamma j, and you end up with uh, gamma i. So if your system of particles obeys by this rule, that is called a non-abelian uh, criterion. So th these operators are non-abelian because of this minus sign here. Yeah. So if I, if I just start from gamma i and I convert it to minus gamma j, and then I go back, I will end up with minus gamma j, um, with minus gamma i. Braiding for the surface code, um, it's called braiding for the same reason, because you move them around each other, and you make uh, such braids uh, on this axis is time. And uh, 
this is a schematic of a, of a little quantum algorithm run on a topological quantum computer. So we uh, saw before quantum algorithms like Grover's algorithm that consi consists of blocks with uh, single qubit gates and double qubit gates that go through two lines. So here again, these lines are individual qubits and these would be um, these would be various gates. Actually, I think these lines are Majoranas, and uh, this would be one qubit. Yeah, I'm sorry. So this this is one qubit then. And um, these two guys are different. Yeah. So the order of operations matters. That's the point here. Even though here we do one twist between these two Majoranas and one twist between these two Majoranas. And here the same, one twist between this pair and one twist between this pair. But in the end, the arrangement of them is different for the two. So. Okay. So one um, disadvantage of this scheme is that this is not a universal scheme. Um, a universal scheme uh, refers to uh, whether or not there is a complete set of quantum gates that you can do on single qubit and double qubit. Uh, and uh, there is not a complete set of gate. So what we uh, looked at for braiding, that implements this uh, important gate, the pi over 4 gate. So with this gate you can build, uh, implement many of the fundamental operations on a quantum computer. And uh, there is a recent paper uh, where they show that if you have, if you do this kind of thing, this kind of uh, braid is uh, equivalent to a C naught gate. So you can do a two qubit gate like that. Um, I actually never followed through to see that this is a C naught gate, but uh, I think this is uh, relatively trustworthy. But um, you cannot do all the single qubit rotations with this scheme. So uh, the one that's missing, I think it is a pi over 8 rotation. So if, if only there was a way to do that, but not. And um, this is actually an interesting difference between uh, all the qubits we discussed before and this proposal, uh, because uh, all the previous qubits, they were continuously controlled. So it, it, they, you could think of them all as spins on a block sphere and you apply a microwave drive and you rotate the spin and you can dial it to any angle you like. Yeah, so there's no problem if you want a pi over 4, fine, just stop here. Pi over 8, stop here. Uh, you can do it continuously. This was also a weakness of these qubits because you need to have very accurate control to dial to exactly the right angle. But at least you could do any angle you like. And these guys are fundamentally uh, different because the only time information changes is when the two Majoranas swap positions. So compared to the spin qubits, you could think of spin qubits as analog qubits because they're continuously changing. And these are like digital qubits. Swap, swap, swap. Swap Majoranas and do something, some operation. And what you do is pi over 4. Do one braid and do pi over 4. So you can do a bunch of pi over 4s, but they don't give you pi over 8. That's the problem. You can get pi over 2. You cannot get pi over 8. Yeah. So um, what's the solution? Well, uh, one solution is to um, couple this system to uh, conventional qubits that have very high quality and rely on those to do the missing operation. 
So whenever you need to do pi over 8, just, uh, you know, transfer it to a spin qubit or a superconducting qubit. And there will be a little bit of decoherence, but uh, maybe the qubit is good enough, you can do it fast enough that uh, you can beat that. So that, that's the best, uh, the best idea so far on the table for, for that. And um, as you may have heard, uh, there are numerous different implementations proposed for uh, Majorana fermions and this topological uh, quantum computation. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the most uh, famous one is uh, actually to do with the two-dimensional electron gases in a, a quantum hole regime where uh, these kind of uh, Majorana fermions are associated with, uh, with the edge states in a fractional quantum hole effect. So that's called the five-halves topological quantum computing. And uh, uh, it's very difficult experiments, very interesting. I did not cover them in this course, but uh, uh, that's because there aren't so many experiments to talk about that uh, show clear clear progress, um, but uh, if you're curious, I encourage you to read about the five-halves topological state. Uh, uh, June worked on it a little bit uh, in last summer, so he can tell you. Um, then there, is a, there are proposals based on nanowires, what I work on, uh, with my Rana fermions and nanowires, and uh, we will talk about that next time. Uh, and there are proposals based on topological insulators, and uh, P-wave superconductors like strontium ruthenate. So basically, um, all of these rely on fairly uh, uh, complicated, unconventional materials, maybe with the exception of nanowires. Those are f relatively uh, easy. So quantum hole effect, those materials are two-dimensional electron gases that we talked about, but the particular state that they're interested in only occurs in the purest uh, two-dimensional electron gases that only maybe a couple of groups in the world can produce. So pretty exotic. Um, and that's what of course hinders the progress. Uh, there have not been identified uh, uh, clearly the single Majoranas yet. So we are in very early stages in this idea. But since it's a, such an out-of-the-box uh, concept, such a beautiful idea. I think that excites people and uh, there is a potential for many uh, breakthrough experiments even though materials are difficult. Perhaps oxide 2 eggs could be a, a good platform for this. We don't know what will win but uh, certainly in the next few years I think there'll be a lot of push in that direction. And the same goes for the other two ideas I described in this lecture. The surface code will be uh, a very active area in the next years. The D-Wave computer, they're uh, making progress there very quickly. And the topological quantum computation will, will remain uh, at the front pages. Right, we stop here. Thanks. <laughs>